uh, the KISS Fellows Liaison, Dr. Maria Sikowski. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle. That was that was a first. Um, thank you all for being here today. It's great to see such a big turnout during the summer uh, months, and it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Marco, Marco Velli, who is a professor of space physics in the Department of Earth, Planetary, and Space Sciences at UCLA. He also holds a joint appointment with JPL. Professor Velli has taught courses and has directed PhD theses all over the world, including the University of Florence, the University of Paris, and now at UCLA. He has been a member of peer review committees for NASA research and payload proposals, as well as a member of the Space Science and Exploration Working Group at the European Space Agency. His research interests lie in space plasma physics and solar magnetic activity. And in fact, in 2014, he was elected a fellow of the American Geophysical Union for his pioneering work on coronal heating, the origin of the solar wind, as well as the theory of solar wind turbulence driven by wave reflection. Um, he is currently the principal investigator of the heliospheric origins with the Parker Solar Probe mission planned to launch um, this coming August. And this is the first spacecraft to fly within nine solar radii of the sun's surface. And this is the mission he is here to talk about today. So I'll hand it over to him. Please welcome our speaker. Well, thanks very much. It's, a, it's an honor to be here and to be able to talk about uh, this mission and about the sun. Um, I've kind of divided up the talk into two parts, uh, a part which is more historical and more general. Um, it's, Caltech is a great place for hosting a talk like this because a lot of the fields that in the, of, the, of the topics that we're going to discuss actually have a connection with Caltech. Um, and then I'll talk about the Parker Solar Probe, and I'll maybe get into a little bit more technical parts at, towards the end, um, if we have time. Otherwise, it doesn't really matter. So I'm going to discuss what we know. We all deal with the sun, uh, but I'm going to discuss a little bit about the sun, the solar corona, and in fact, the environment of our star within the galaxy and within the interstellar medium, which is what we call the heliosphere. And I'll begin because really the study of the solar corona is, is, is part of the study of the beginning of space physics. I'll then discuss um, uh, the mission, Parker Solar Probe, why we have to do this mission, why it's been on the charts for so long and we're finally coming close to doing it. And then, then I'll discuss a bit of plasma physics of some of the dynamics and what some of the answers that we are looking for um, from Parker Solar Probe. So to get started, um, uh, I used to have a little blurb here when I discussed this, you know, the sun is really on the outskirts of our galaxy, as you know. Uh, it's pretty far from the center. It's an ordinary little star. If you look at it a little bit closer, it's sitting in a very complicated interstellar medium, which is made up of old bubbles, dust clouds, and things like that. But fortunately, we don't, we're not really, we're not leeching, we don't really know much about that directly, fortunately, because we're protected, and uh, we're protected in many ways. And this is a picture now of uh, what, the, what the sun's environment looks like as created by the fact that the sun has an active magnetic field. So as a result of that, the sun has a wind that blows a bubble in the, inter, uh, in the interstellar space. And we now have explored with the Voyager spacecraft that um, were uh, based here, um, the actual outskirts of this heliosphere. So in some sense, Parker Solar Probe is the opposite to Voyager. It's going really to the source, the origin of why uh, the sun has this um, outer atmosphere and blows this bubble into interplanetary space. So this is the sun, nice beautiful orange. Um, I've used the metric system throughout, but if you want, I can tell you in miles, things uh, is the same. So the solar, the sun is the disk that you see of the sun. Never look at the sun, but uh, <laughs> always a reminder, but you know, tend to, you know that it's the size of about a quarter at an arm's length. Um, that's the dimension of the disk of the sun as, as you see it. And that diameter is about 700,000 kilometers, okay, slight shy of 500,000 miles. And most of it is a, a, is a radiative um, zone where you have fusion at the center, then the heat starts coming outwards, um, and it's brought by basically radiation. Photons take tons of years to come out from here. Um, but then the gradient of the heat becomes so large that convection starts up. And when convection starts up, uh, things become more dynamic, and the, the part of the sun that you see in the sky 
is called a photosphere, and it's sitting at a moderate temperature, you know, around 6,000 degrees centigrade. Um, that's more or less 12,000 12, degrees Fahrenheit. And it's your average kind of run-of-the-mill star. Some numbers in terms of the solar radius, because it's important because we're going to go close, so it's good to have an idea. So the, how far is the Earth? One astronomical unit is the definition of the distance of the Earth to the Sun. In terms of solar radii, that is 215 solar radii. So you can put essentially 200, well, 100 suns, 100 suns between you and the Sun itself. Okay? Um, and in terms of the radius of the Earth and the radius of the Sun, it's pretty much a, a factor of 100. Okay? A little bit more than 100. All right? Okay, the other thing is the sun is a rotating star. It rotates in about 27 days, okay? But the thing is that the sun doesn't end at its surface, okay? The sun uh, continues outward, as we'll see. So let me not give that away, but I just want, let me just uh, continue a little more. We know that the sun doesn't end there. You see that the outskirts of the sun have something during solar eclipses. But let me give you some more numbers before we do that. So we owe our life here, everything, to the sun, right? So the radiation, that radiation, the sun that we're not supposed to look at, brings the heat that is required to live on Earth. And that is about, in terms of energy, of, you know, if you want to compare it to the energy that you guys use, that's 1.36 kilowatts per square meter. Okay, so that's more than abundant energy for us to survive here on the Earth. However, the sun doesn't only have a photosphere and it doesn't only radiate away. The rest of my talk is going to be dedicated to something which is puny compared to this amount of energy. And it's because the sun's influence extends outward through the solar system because outside of that ball that we've just seen, there's a surprising medium, which is called the solar corona. Now, the solar corona is a gas um, which is sitting at a few million degrees. And that's very strange because the source of the energy is at the center of the sun. And indeed, the temperature of the sun goes down as you move towards the, out, towards the outside. But when you reach the photosphere, something dramatic happens. The density drops but the temperature goes up. And that kind of violates all we know about thermodynamics. But as a result of that, the, the, solar, the, the sun's atmosphere actually expands outward. It expands outward so much that we can think of the Earth as being embedded in the sun's atmosphere. By the time it gets to the Earth, this atmosphere is expanding supersonically, very fast, 700 kilometers per second. And it's dropped in temperature just a little bit. It's, a, it's still... Uh, a few hundred thousand degrees, but it's very rarefied, and that's why we can go out there, otherwise it would be impossible. Now, all of that energy, which creates all sorts of things that we'll discuss more in detail, is only 1.6 of a thousand percent of the radiation of the sun, and yet it's fundamental to the existence of life on Earth and to the protection of our, of our world from high-energy particles throughout the universe. So it's really important and it's, the reason it's important is that there's a big difference between the way this radiation is distributed. The major source of radiation is thermodynamic. Here, it's radiation that uses almost mostly invisible light. But here, the mechanics that produces the corona comes through the interaction with magnetic fields. And magnetic fields act to give structure to the outer atmosphere of the sun, to store energy, and then to release it. And this energy is released to, in the equivalent way of a few million atomic bombs, our most powerful atomic bombs, a few million of them per hour in the outer solar atmosphere are going off every day, every hour, to produce this extended corona. And that basic physics is the one we don't understand. So the magnetized solar wind outflow creates a cavity in the interstellar medium, which we call the heliosphere, which I've just shown you. And that magnetic field brought out which comes from the sun and is brought out by the solar wind, actually protects us from cosmic rays um, in the, in the um, heliosphere. And the sun's magnetic activity, now that we've gone out into space, of course, is, affects everything. So what am I showing you here? I'm showing you a coronagraph, a movie, a coronagraph image. The sun is hidden by this mass that you see here. And you can actually see that there's an outflow coming from the sun itself. And you can see that there's an outflow which appears to be more or less continuous and tranquil. And then you see there are things that look like explosions that are occurring. Those are called flares and coronal mass ejections. And you notice that you get some kind of sprinkler effect or snow on your detectors. Those are solar energetic particles 
that are hitting the detractor and they come when you have a major eruption on the sun. So those are very dangerous for instruments and for people um, that are in interplanetary space. So there's a radiation hazard for astronauts. Um, these particles then um, affect the Earth's magnetosphere and cause aurora, as we shall see. Now this is an image which shows superposed a solar eclipse and the sun itself. So you see now that the sun, the visible sun, is the disk that you usually see, is surrounded by an extremely structured atmosphere. And it really does look like when you play with iron filings with magnets. And indeed, that's what gives structure. It's the solar magnetic field. And the solar magnetic field, therefore, has a, has a role in taking the energy which is present in the convection at the surface of the sun, transforming it into currents, storing it in this outer atmosphere, and then creating these explosions that then propagate and propel, heat this medium and propel it outward into interplanetary space. This is another uh, eclipse image. It's the same image, it's only been tilted a little bit. And you can see that this kind of structure disappears as you move away from the sun. So why Parker Solar Probe? Parker Solar Probe is to understand this basic dynamics. Why does the solar corona exist? How does it generate in a solar wind? And how do these energetic particles get accelerated close to the sun and then reach out into interplanetary space? Now the solar wind has a typical structure and it's basically a very fast flow coming from the poles of the sun. But um, at the equator of the sun, and I'll explain a little bit more in detail, you have stronger magnetic fields. And these magnetic fields also tend to confine the gas. So the wind becomes a little bit lower. This is a polar plot. So this is a speed as a function of angle. So you see high above the poles of the sun, you have 750 kilometers per second. The sound speed in the same region is about 50 kilometers per second. So this is a high Mach number flow. It's an extremely supersonic flow. Mach 12, Mach 15. Okay? And even in its slowest regions, which is 300 kilometers per second, it's still abundantly supersonic. You've all seen the eclipse, uh, perhaps. <laughs> this was my first total solar eclipse last year in August, so that's me trying to enjoy it. Um, and that's just the picture of the corona that came from a standard camera. Of course, if you know how to play with the image, this is what comes out. Uh, and so you can see then, this is the really very beautiful eclipse. And you see that it has these rays coming out. And this is really the magnetic field of the sun stretching out from the poles. And you can really see that it looks like, you know, the standard pictures of magnetic fields that we have with little loops coming out and confining it. But the problem with the difference between the image that you get from an iron filing is that this stuff is alive. And when I say alive, it means it's continuously dynamic. It contains very, very strong currents. And these are the regions where these millions of atomic bombs are going off continuously. Okay. Some history, that's the connection to Caltech. Let's come back, way back. Since when do we know that there are magnetic fields on the sun? Well, that is uh, George Ellery Hale, who invented the spectroheliograph and was the first to measure the Zeeman effect in sunspots. And in fact, deduced that sunspots had to be magnetic. George Ellery Hale is the one who, found it, who funded the telescope on Mount Wilson that discovered the expansion of the universe, just to give you the context of why he was such an important figure. He then went around fundraising to be, to be able to create the telescope in Mount Palomar when he realized that it was very important to do a bigger telescope to understand more about the universe. But his interest was in understanding the magnetism of the sun itself. Now that, that the sun had this thing going on was known for a long time. Um, indeed, even on the photosphere, when these explosions in the outer atmosphere of the sun occur, sometimes they can become so bright that they actually brighten the sun a little bit. And indeed, Carrington in the late um, uh, 19th century found that when you had these huge brightenings that are called solar flares, they could cause auroras about 16 hours later. Um, in, you know, and towards the end of the century, Fitzgerald and Laws proposed the idea that there were charged particles that were propagating away from the sun and hitting the Earth. And they calculated a speed of 400, 480 kilometers per second. And here's when the authoritarian principle comes in in, fix, in physics, unfortunately. So for the students here, don't trust your professors, um, especially if they're very short and they tell you something is wrong without motivating why it's wrong. Physics is hard. A lot of us know very little. Um, and so Lord Kelvin, who was a very important figure, um, decided that that was a coincidence. And that meant the end of the studies of this field in essentially in Great Britain for a long time. In the 1930s, 
uh, people started um, imagining how the dipole of the Earth's magnetic field could be compressed by this charged particles coming in. But then, really in the same, more or less the same period, it was discovered that some of the light that could be seen so during solar eclipses, atomic physics, of course, made great strides between the 19th century and early 20th century, and you started seeing lines. Of course, you know why helium is called helium. Helium was recognized by its spectrum seen in the sun. That's why it's called helium. But at the same time, people invented nebulium because they saw these strange lines coming from nebula in interstellar space, and even coronium. And what these lines were, though, nebulium and coronium, these were not lines from unknown atoms. They were lines from known atoms, but in very strange states. So this greenish bluish line um, that was called coronium was found to be a, the emission line of extremely ionized particles, iron and oxygen and things like that. And that meant that the temperature of this medium had to be incredibly high. That's how they discovered that the corona had to be hot because they saw that particles had to exist with lots of electrons ripped off of them. So you had atoms with all these electrons ripped off, it meant it had to be very hot. And they estimated the temperature as being a million, million, two million degrees. Now, if you have a temperature of a few million degrees and you start knocking off electrons from particles, then you create a charged medium. And the charged medium is called a plasma, and it behaves in a strange way. If this really is sitting at 2 million degrees, the strange thing that happens is the following. You all know that when you throw something up, I don't want to break this, gravity tends to bring you back down. And the reason the sun doesn't blow apart is that its gravitational field keeps matter on it. But if I now start ripping electrons off of particles, electrons are extremely light. They have very little mass. And at temperatures of 2 million degrees, they have incredibly high speeds more than 1,000 kilometers per second. And the escape speed from the sun is only 600 kilometers per second. So an electron which is ripped off and very hot can just leave. And if it leaves, something funny is going to happen. The sun is going to start charging, because if the electrons are leaving, then the atmosphere is going to start charging positively, and it's going to create an electric field. And the electric field is going to pull the electrons back and pull out the positively charged particles, the protons and the hydrogen that's been left behind. The result of all this mix is that this corona is going to expand outwards. The problem is, how fast is it going to go? Well, when you look at comets, you see some interesting thing. You see the standard kind of dust tail that you see here, but you also see a tail which is always straight out from the sun. If you look at this in this picture, the sun is down here. So the standard dust tail that you see follows kind of the orbit. There's some influence of the sun on it, but it kind of follows the orbit. But there's this thing pointing straight out. And people thought, Bierman in particular, thought, well, maybe it's, this is coming straight out because this, these things are charged particles and they're interacting with something which is flowing out. So I'm really seeing something which is being pushed outwards. And he estimated 470 kilometers per second. So we're in the 50s now. And we're, some people are starting to say that the sun doesn't end at the sun, but it has to flow outward. Then, of course, in 1957, um, Korolev um, launches Sputnik, and I'm just, I, I always show this picture from the New York Times because it's very interesting from a social political point of view. Of course, people got scared stiff in the US when this happened, and the reason you can imagine. So what did the New York Times do? It said, well, wait a minute. This spacecraft can't really be used to drop bombs or anything, although it was the beginning, really, of the arms race. Um, so New York Times says that it would have no practicable military application in the foreseeable future and could not be used to drop atomic hydrogen bombs. The real significance would come on the new information concerning the nature of the sun, the cosmic radiation, the cosmic rays that had already been observed, solar radio interference. And these things are going to be fundamental, says the New York Times in 1957, for those of who are working on the problem of sending missiles and eventually men into the vast reaches of the solar system. Of course, that's essentially the program of research that we're still involved with and that we're still trying to understand, but that was not the real reason, of course, for the whole space program, although it was an important part. Well, the same year, at the end of the same year, 1958, Eugene Parker, who was a professor at the University of Chicago, um, decided or understood that this incredible heating that had to be occurring in the corona meant that the outer atmosphere of the sun behaved much like a jet engine. 
This is what a jet engine looks like. There is a, there's a chamber which you heat material up, then the chamber is choked and then it expands. And the result of the choking and the expansion is that the flow transforms the internal hot energy of the gas here into flow energy out here. So you have the emission of a, of a supersonic flow. And there's a point where the flow becomes supersonic. And Parker predicted that there had to be this position so that there was going to be an expansion that became supersonic at some distance from the sun. And indeed, the Russians that were continuing on their program fi continued to fire rockets. Luna 2 was supposed to hit the moon, but it missed. And so it became the first satellite to go into the interplanetary medium. And they made the first measurements, sort of my mistake, of the particles of the solar wind. Then in the 1960s, and this is again, I'm showing you here two people that worked at JPL for most of their lives, uh, Marcia Neugebauer and Ed Smith. They worked on the Mariner 2 uh, plasma and magnetometer, and this is the 1962 press conference, the solar wind was discovered. Mar Mariner 2 was traveling to Venus, and on its way to Venus, it measured a continuous outflow of particles from the sun with speeds between 400 and 800 kilometers per second. And now we know that these changing speeds have to do with the morphology of the magnetic field on the sun and the different ways in which it is heated. So these years, we discover space right after, at the same time, there's a prediction that a solar wind has to exist, but we still don't know the basic mystery of why the sun has a corona. Why on earth is this stuff going on? So right away, already in the 50s, people said, well, the only way, now that we've kind of understood that there's this engine, we have to go to see how the engine works. And so the idea of sending a probe close to the sun came about already at the beginning of the space age, the Simpson report in 1958. I'm just showing you here some of the different designs and orbits that were thought of. Okay, so this is star probe. This dates from 1980. And the idea here, this was a mission at JPL, was to go into a polar orbit, to go really close to the surface of the sun into the corona. It's very hard to fall on the sun from the Earth, right? Why? Because the Earth's orbiting around the sun at 30 kilometers per second. And so if I just leave the Earth slowly, I'm going to be just going around the sun at 30 kilometers per second. If I want to fall into the sun, I have to kill that speed. And they're not, it's not easy. We can't produce any spacecraft that goes at 30 kilometers per second. We can't launch anything with that kind of speed. The maximum speed we can get to is 11 something, much less than that. So we can't fall onto the sun. We can't lose the angular momentum. So the only way to do that is to use a big body, maybe Jupiter, for example, that can slow us down. If you send a satellite to Jupiter from behind, Jupiter will attract it and then bounce it backwards. And that backward bounce seen from the sun kills its speed so that it can fall inwards. So one way to go to, to, go to the sun is to go out to Jupiter and then fall in. That was the idea. The idea was to go to Jupiter, all the way out to Jupiter, as you can see, this is the orbit, you know, going around, you go out to Jupiter and bang, you fall into the sun. You're not actually falling into the sun. You're going into a polar orbit that zips by the sun and comes back out. And for many years, this was the idea to go into the solar corona at a distance of say four or five solar radii. You need a heat shield, right? Because the temperature I was saying is a few million degrees plus the radiation of the sun at that distance is immense. So you see these huge heat shields um, in these solar probe concepts. Um, then I, I started being involved in this mission um, at the end of um, at the beginning of the year 2000s. It was still thought that the best thing to do was go to four solar radii with a polar pass. But if you think of it a little more carefully, this mission is fun to do. But look at the timing here. The time it takes for the probe to go from this height all the way down to this height is about eight hours, nine hours. So can you imagine putting all the energy and the technology into a mission that will then only give you nine hours of data. It's very hard to understand what's going on with data which lasts months. Never <laughs> Can you imagine having only nine hours of data trying to figure out what the probe was seeing during this flyby? So <clears throat> in the final uh, science definition team at the end of 2008, we came up with the idea of doing a mission that would not go all the way out to Jupiter to slow down. It would therefore stay inside the ecliptic plane but it would use Venus, but Venus is much lighter. So Venus is much lighter, and so you have to go by Venus many more times. That makes for a mission that kind of crawls its way inward towards the inner parts of the solar system. And that's the 
concept that we have today, the solar probe. It used to be called solar probe, but then in honor of Parker, this is the original diagram of the prediction of the solar wind acceleration. This is the, the speed of the wind as a function of distance from the sun. This is his original kind of diagram of how the wind should accelerate outwards. So in honor of Parker, it was decided to change the name of the mission from Solar Probe and Solar Probe Plus to Parker Solar Probe, and that's him receiving a little model of the spacecraft in May of, the, of um, last year. Okay, so what is this Parker Solar Probe going to do? The idea of the Parker Solar Probe is to understand, to determine the structure and the dynamics of the magnetic fields in the outer solar atmosphere understand how the corona gets heated, what's going on, what creates um, the, the plasma there, and then once this is heated, how this wind is accelerated, and then determine how these bombs and explosions create the um, energetic particles that are seen. And to do that, you really have to go. I showed you that you have a supersonic engine. To understand how it works, you have to go see the chamber. That means going inside the region where the acceleration is taking place. And that region is inside 12 solar radii from the surface. It's what's called the subalvenic because we have to consider magnetic sound rather than simple sound. And for the magnetic field, this region is inside 12 solar radii, say. So this is a schematic picture showing the acceleration of the solar wind. This is the speed associated with magnetic waves. Um, this is the previous explored missions and solar probe. It's still called solar probe plus on this image. Now it's called Parker solar probe. We'll go into nine solar radii from the surface of the sun. There are lots of reasons that we have to go inside this region. Right when the solar wind becomes supersonic, which is this intersection here, is where the maximum temperature of the solar corona is. It's where the turbulence is the strongest. And it's also the place where particles stop colliding with each other, where the plasma becomes collisionless. And I'll discuss that just a little bit in the more technical part in a little, in a little while. OK, so this is your solar wind. This is not the orbit of the probe, but it's showing you where the perihelia will be. So you can imagine the things that probe will be able to see um, by being um, in perihelion at such a distance from the sun. This is again another similar coronagraph. This is an image taken by a spacecraft sitting at the L1 point, the Lagrangian point between the Earth and the sun, close to the Earth, continuously monitoring the solar wind, um, as you can see. You probably maybe saw some comments there as well. Okay, so how do we do this? Well, the original launch date was July 31st, 2018. So now, <laughs> um, the launch has been delayed by slightly over a week. So the present launch date is August 6th. Um, and so we launch August 6th, and we launch with a high speed, a high C3, and we directly encounter Venus right away at the end of September. And by encountering, encountering Venus right away, see, we're catching up with Venus from behind. Everyone's rotating this way, by the way, uh, in this picture. Huh? So, <laughs> um, so we're catching up with Venus from behind. That slows us down and allows us to fall in to inside the orbit of Mercury, about half the distance. Nobody's ever explored underneath the orbit of Mercury. So that we're going to straight off in uh, September. And in December of this year, we'll have our first closest flyby of the sun at about half the distance of Mercury. So we'll already be in an unexplored region ever. And every time in space we've gone to places where we haven't been before, we've, we've, heard, we've seen stuff that we didn't expect. Humans do not have a great imagination. They have a lot of good after the fact imagination. But before the fact, much harder. This, I have to tell you this because I remember when I was studying in high school, we hadn't discovered any exoplanets, right? So I remember taking these courses and listening to the course of the University of Pisa telling us about possible other solar systems. And they were all lined up just like ours. All the planets had, all Jupiter had to be out there, the Saturns had to be out there, the rocky planets had to be inside. Then guess what? We finally observed some stellar system, no way. <laughs> Hot Jupiter's all over the place, just, just, just an example. Okay, so we then come back out, we encounter Venus again, fall in, out, in, out, in. As you see, this mission lasts a long time. Finally, we finally made it, make it to, uh, um, to, uh, um, to um, 9.86 solar radii from the center, 8.86 from the surface on December 19th, 2024. Okay. So it takes about seven years, a little less, six years, slightly more than six, between six and seven years to get us into that perihelion. And we'll be going to be exploring this inner part of the uh, heliosphere 
uh, continuous. The heliosphere is just, by definition, the heliosphere is this region of space where the solar wind blows outward and therefore is not influenced by the interstellar medium directly. Okay, so these are, we don't really care. These are distances, a function of time, tables, we don't care. So what's on this spacecraft? The spacecraft contains a series of instruments that are designed to understand what's going on. First and foremost, a series of measurements of the electric and magnetic fields, uh, uh, this here, called fields investigation. So there's a series of antenna and magnetometers to measure the magnetic field. Energetic particles. We want to measure the spectra, how, much, how many particles have so much energy, where they're accelerated at the sun. So there's an instrument suite dedicated to that. And Part of the instrument is being built here in Caltech. Then there's a, uh, an instrument to measure the rest of the particles that are coming from the sun, the protons, the electrons. It's so hot that even helium gets ionized completely. So alpha particles are the main component of the solar wind. There is then a small telescope, which is really just a coronagraph, which uses the shield as an occulter to observe the solar corona. And that also has a component which is being studied here uh, at JPL. Um, it's called WISPR, Wide Field Imager. And I am sort of a um, theory integrator of all these different instruments to make sure that they all work together the way they're supposed to. So here it is. It's actually been built. Um, you will see in movies, it's covered in silver colored foil in the older idea. This is supposed to be gold color. So some of the movies that I'll show you have gold color on them, but that's not important. But what you're seeing here is that there's a big, so this, how big is this? You might ask, this is about three meters high. Okay, so it's about slightly less than two of me, one on top of, top of each other, so to speak. And that's a little bit, that's, that's about the same there, the diameter. And so this is the heat shield. It's a carbon carbon. You can see it's, it's a, um, tens of centimeters thick and coated with a ceramic coating. Here we see the high gain antenna, which is gonna transmit data back to the earth once we get out uh, once we're close enough. When we're really close to the sun, we can't really do anything. And the other important thing are the instruments that are mostly sitting in the back, except for this little thing here, which is called a Faraday cup, which sits in the front. So you may say, if you have this heat shield and all the instruments are sitting behind, how are you going to do your measurements? <laughs> you're going to the sun and then you're not looking at it. It's cool, right? Well, the point is that we're going so fast around the sun, we're going to be going at about 200 kilometers per second that we're going to see it via aberration, just like when rain, you're going in a car, the rain comes from the side, the solar wind is going to be coming from the side. So most of the solar wind is going to come into the instruments from the side, so they actually use the heat shield to protect them. They sit at a comfortable 20 degrees centigrade, and only the very, very fast particles that are going really close to the speed of light, um, they come straight hitting at you, um, are being measured directly by this little thing that comes out. Um, that the antenna are out and I'll show you them in a second. So this is a distribution of the instruments. So it's a, the, the spacecraft works with retractable solar panels. Uh, there's a heat shield. This is the Faraday cup I just showed you, showed you. How do you do, what do you do with the heat? So the heat comes in here. Remember at 10 solar radii, it's 215. We're, we're seeing 500 suns. That's the equivalent of about 500 suns. So it's like having 500, you know, an area uh, corresponding to 500 suns. That's very hot. So you have to get rid of the heat. There's a radiator right behind the shield and it's filled with water. It's really just like the radiator of your car. Uh, it absorbs the heat and radiates it out towards the back in the shade. Then we have all the instruments here. The antenna are sitting out in the front. The reason we have the antenna sitting out in the front is that we want to measure the solar wind. If we had the antenna out in the back, what we would measure would be the interaction of the wind with the spacecraft, which creates a wake, just like a boat in the ocean. You don't want to measure the wake. You want to measure the wind. So you ha those have to sit out in the front. This is the antenna, the high gain antenna, and the other instruments are in the back here. You can see the solar arrays, and solar arrays are strange. They have this little bend, and the reason is that the uh, arrays that work when you're far from the sun, this, the instrument also has to face very cold. When you're out at the Earth, space is really cold from the point of view, you're saying, what are, what are you talking about? Uh, you, know, you just said it was very hot. It is. It's very, very hot, but there are so few particles that for a large object like this, it's actually very cold, especially if you're in the shade. Okay, so this, it's a little bit uh, complex thing. And then you have these booms way to the back 
containing the magnetic field magnetometers to measure the magnetic field. Let me skip over that. Uh, let me skip over this. I just want to show you a movie. So one of the interesting things, the sun is rotating. It's a complicated object. And you're moving around really fast. So this is a spacecraft moving around the sun. And I'm going to show you its trajectory on the sun. This is a movie made by Paulette Lever um, and the group uh, that was led by Eric de Jong at, at JPL, who's no longer with us, unfortunately. But you're seeing now the trajectory of the spacecraft as seen in a, in a frame which is rotating with the sun. So when the spacecraft is very far away, the sun is rotating, so the spacecraft is moving like this. But when it gets very close to the sun, it rotates much faster than the sun. And so it goes retrograde, and then it comes back out. Now, the interesting thing are these two points that you see here. You'll see it again. At those two points where you move from moving forward to backward, if it were in a circular orbit, it would be sitting at the same distance. So, but now the spacecraft is going in and out from the sun. So it's actually sitting on the same place on the sun and zipping inward towards the sun at very high speed. So that in a period of about two days, it sees the gas that's coming from the same region on the sun. And it builds its history, how it accelerates, how its thermodynamics works during that whole period of time. So that is a very important aspect of this uh, form of the mission that I neglected to um, discuss. When are we launching? Um, the sun has a magnetic field. The magnetic field is generated by a dynamo. We know that it has a, there's a cycle of magnetic activity. And the solar wind depends on the activity cycle. I didn't have time to get into this in detail. Um, I'm close to ending, so um, I won't. But it's very hard to predict the solar cycle. It's the other mysterious problem. There, the solar physics, so to speak, the, the basic physics of the sun that we really don't understand is, on the one hand, how the sun regenerates its own magnetic field. It's called the dynamo problem. And then once it generates this magnetic field, how the magnetic field creates the corona, energetic particles, etc. Solar probe is devoted to the second part, but will not really uh, help us understand directly how the dynamo is created. We know there's a dynamo, so sunspots go up and down. The intensity of the magnetic field goes up and down. And solar probe is launching now, which kind of looks like here. So it's going to be going during the ascending phase of the solar cycle, and it will see both solar minimum and solar maximum. OK. Um, I don't know if I want to get it. So this is, this is um, just a few graphs that will go into a few more details of uh, some of the things that we're trying to understand. So this is a graph of the temperature of the sun as a function of the distance from the sun. Okay? So this is the sun where you see it, the photosphere. The temperature is a few thousand degrees. And then this is where the sun should end. If there were no magnetic field and nothing strange happening, the sun should end here. There should be black void. I could have shown you a picture from the 50s where people thought that, in fact, there was absolute zero between the Earth and the moon. But as I said, the temperature goes up. There's a strong transition region. And if you notice, this, this, are, this is 10,000, 100,000, a million. And over a very few small region, the temperature goes way up to 2 million degrees. And this is where probe is going to come in to observe. So we're going to try to understand this region here. This is the corona that we see. So if you imagine the sun as a magnet, and then you have particles, and I'll just maybe describe that in a second, but I won't have much, a lot of time. What, the sun, what this hot gas does it, it, is it stretches the field out. Where the field is already open, particles can just move along them, and I'll get to that in a second. But where it's really closed, it has a hard time. So that's why the wind is kind of slow here and fast here. The sun also rotates, so the magnetic field gets ro rolled up into a spiral sprinkler-like structure. Imagine that you, the sun is a sprinkler and the sprinkler is rotating. It's emitting wind, and you well know that the sprinklers become spirals, and that's why kids have so much fun too, right? So that, that sprinkler happens to be tilted too, so that generates a structure within the heliosphere, within the rotating planets, which is called a ballerina skirt, like so. Um, and I will probably close here. I just want to tell you uh, just a few reasons why the behavior of the system is so complicated. And the fact is that the corona is a plasma. I told you it's a very high temperature medium. The electrons are ripped off the protons. And this medium where the particles are charged has its own behavior. Um, there used to be this joke that would go around. We, plasma physics has become very important. It, it, was, it, it grew in the 
uh, last century, the early part of last century, that's when it was defined. And it's very important for the, for the reasons that you see there. Um, it's important, this is a graph of the typical types of plasmas that exist in the universe, temperature and number density. So the solar core is very dense and very hot. Then the solar corona is very hot, but not so dense at all. The aurora is cooler and even less dense. Lightning is also, lightning is a beam of electrons going between the earth and clouds. And then we're trying to create nuclear fusion on earth in a confined way and we want to use magnetic fields. And I'll get to that in a second. That's going to be my final few words uh, today. But plasmas behave in a very strange way and they're everywhere in the universe. And magnetic fields and plasmas dominate the high energy behavior of the universe. So everything, most of the things that you see from things that are far away, even in astrophysics, have to do with magnetic fields. The joke had it, people used to say, <laughs> that magnetic fields were to astrophysics what sex is to psychoanalysis. When there's a problem you can't understand in astrophysics, you say it's the magnetic field because the behavior is so anti-intuitive, okay? So I'm gonna give you my two slide version of the basic of plasma physics for everyone, and then I'll stop. So a plasma is different from a standard gas that you have. In a standard gas, you have, it's like billiards knocking against each other, okay? So if you take a hot gas and a cold gas and you put them together, what happens? The hot gas is fast billiards. They start knocking into the slow billiards. The slower ones go faster, the faster ones go slower, and everyone relaxes to some average. That's what happens. You put an ice cube in water, the ice cube melts, the water becomes warmer. All is well. Ah, in a plasma, that doesn't happen. In a plasma, what happens is that if a particle is moving, moving faster, it doesn't see, it's as though the size of the object depended on how fast you were going. So the cross section, the size of an object becomes smaller if you're going faster. So you got a weird situation. You start off with everybody the same. Suppose you push someone just a little bit faster. It's gonna not see anybody else anymore. It's not gonna collide. So if there's any force pushing it, it's gonna go faster and faster and faster because it's not gonna collide with anything. And if you get stuck being slower, that's it. So once a particle goes fast, if there's a force, it's gonna go faster. So in a plasma, so in standard thermodynamics, if the rich try to get too rich, they collide with the poor and everyone becomes kind of average. But in a plasma, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. So these things get segregated. A plasma is very not nice. It's called inverse Robin Hood effect. And, and that means things are strange. No wonder we have cosmic rays. This is one of the reasons we have cosmic rays hitting us from everywhere. High energy particles don't collide very well. So we know this is, this is easy to say, but it's hard then to derive in detail how this stuff works. And the other thing is the magnetic field and then I'll stop. So in a, in a neutral gas, you guys can walk around with magnetic fields and nothing really happens. Although you've heard that you're not supposed to use your cell phone too much close to your head and things like that. Those are time varying things that have to do with electric fields. But if a particle is charged, it can't do that. If a particle is charged, it's basically tied to the magnetic field. It can't cross. So if there's a magnetic field here and an electron comes around, there's a magnetic field pointing upwards, it goes whoop and spins around and goes back. It cannot cross. And in fact, this is a picture of protons and electrons. The electrons a small guy going around and the protons in this guy. Proton goes around a magnetic field using her left hand. The electron uses right hand. So in fact, they do this strange dance across magnetic fields. Now the fact that electric field particles can't cross fields means that if the field is moving, the particles have to go with them. But it can also be turned around. If there are a lot more particles than fields, then the field has to follow the particles. So you've got this strange thing where the particles want to follow the fields and the fields want to follow the particles and the dynamics becomes very complicated. The way I think of it is particles and fields become um, intrinsically intertwined. It's complicated because of that. So that's why we don't really understand. That's why we don't have, that's the simple reason why we don't have fusion on earth because we cannot really govern the way these things behave together. Although we use magnetic fields to try to confine. This is the reason why we use magnetic fields to try to confine. And the same thing happens on the sun. And I will just close here. Let me, let me skip everything. I will close with some of the anomalous behavior 
Why isn't this running? Okay, there we go. So this is the sun, the beautiful sun that you see. And you see this kind of snake. It looks like, looks like a Chinese dragon, uh, uh, you know, sitting outside. This is where the sun ends. This is the corona. And you now see this huge structure, very thin, which is living on the sun. You see these portholes where you have the impression that the solar wind is coming out. And next to these portholes, you see this line, and here's another one. But now I've colored it so that you can see the different magnetic field. This is plus magnetic field and minus magnetic field. So what's happening is outside here, the field is probably open. But this snake is underneath a tunnel of magnetic field, which is coming out, coming over, and coming back in. This thing lives for a while and then becomes unstable. This, the magnetic field can't tolerate that anymore. And this is to give you an idea of the dimensions of these things. This is a filament that we've just been looking at or something like it. And that's the size of the Earth, okay, on the same scale. Huh? So those are the dimensions we're discussing. These things tend to blow up and take off. So these are the snakes. This is one eruption here. There's going to be another one here, another one there. There's, you saw one there, another one there. And we really don't understand these eruptions, but we think they're related to the same thing that happens when we try to do fusion on Earth. So learning about this and understanding this in a natural system is fundamental. Okay, I think I'll stop there. And I hope I've given you an idea of why we're doing this crazy thing of trying to go to the sun and what we want to understand. I'll just come back to the end here, just show you a nice movie. This is a movie showing the telescope that um, movie come from Paulette Lieber and JPL showing you the the chronograph, what it will see. And I'll stop here. Thank you.